Hi, this is Margie Basso, and welcome to East Link Magazine. I'm here today with Luke Whittle with Talking Wine with Luke, and we're at row 13 in the Sparkling Cave. So Luke, welcome, thank you so much for coming, and I understand today we're going to talk about the difference between champagne and sparkling wine. So let's start off perhaps with what you have here to showcase. Sure, this is the uh, Road 13 Sparkling Chenin Blanc, and we're in the cave, the Sparkling Cave for Road 13. They've uh, let us down here uh, somehow, and uh, it's a wonderful, beautiful room. If you ever get a chance to come by, please do. Uh, this is their Sparkling Chenin Blanc. I've heard this called the best sparkling wine in British Columbia by, by numerous people. Uh, I've been a fan for a long time, since they first released it in 2006. And uh, basically, a very unique wine made from uh, 44-year-old Chenin Blanc vines that are right here on the Golden Mile, so just south of Oliver. Amazing. And I know that uh, they've permitted us to have a, a sampling, so perhaps you can pour it and just, uh, as you're pouring, just talk a little bit about how you can recognize a good quality champagne. Sure. Well, so, oh, I shouldn't say that. It's not champagne. We'll get to that. The oh, difference okay. between a champagne and a sparkling wine. So this is what you're looking for. You want lots of bubbles. You want lots of little fine, fine bubbles. We call that mousse in, uh, in wine terms. But basically, the, the finer the mousse, the longer it will last, and uh, the bubblier it will be, and therefore the, the bigger celebration, I guess you could say. Um, but basically, it's, uh, it's a wonderful, and, and with sparkling wine, you'll, you'll always see that kind of persistent, you see it's still kind of bubbling around a little bit. Um, and it just makes for, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful occasion, you know, when you crack one of these open, it's just celebrating time. You know? Well, and I know uh, a lot of women such as myself, that's probably my favorite out of red wine, white wine and sparkling wine. Yeah. I am a sparkling wine fanatic, I must say. I don't know if I'm connoisseur, but I'd love to be able to tell the difference between them. I mm. kind of know what I like and what I don't like. And, and perhaps that's why we're doing these segments is to find out maybe the reasons sure. why. Now, when you were mentioning the bubbles, are you talking about the foam that you're looking for or more the consistency of the carbonation that's coming through at the bottom? The second thing, more the consistency of the of the bubbles as it's as it's poured. You notice when I poured it, there was quite a bit of foam there, but it did recede back fairly quickly. Um, that isn't really an indication of quality quite so much as much as as it's that the bubbles are are still persistent and they're still going and that they're very tiny. Uh, wines that are made in a different way, and this is re really reflected in how this particular wine is made, and we can actually see it being made behind us right now. These the, the bottles in the racks behind us are being aged, and basically those are from vintages that haven't been released yet. When you make a sparkling wine, I, first of all, if you want to talk about the difference between champagne yeah, and sparkling that. wine, champagne is basically uh, is sparkling wine that's made at, in a particular region in France, in the Champagne region of France. What most of these wines here, except for one uh, that we'll talk about as sparkling wine made here in British Columbia, in, in Oliver actually, uh, the difference here is that it's made in the same style, they made the same tradition, so all the techniques in winemaking are exactly the same as they do in Champagne, but because we're not in Champagne, we're in Oliver, we can't call it Champagne. So we could call it Oliver if you want to, but it doesn't have as catchy a name sometimes. <laughs> so. Um, so we call it sparkling wine, and throughout the rest of the world, in California and in uh, all kinds of, you know, in Australia, they'll call it sparkling wine uh, instead, even though it is made in exactly the same way as Champagne is made. Interesting. That's good to know because I, originally I thought that was two different things and I am a champagne lover and so it's good to know that sparkling wine is equivalent. Now, <clears throat> I also didn't realize that we have a lot of local sparkling wines being carried by our wineries and I know we're showcasing some today. So perhaps we can go through a couple of the ones because I know there's quite a few, but mm -hmm. there's some here that you wanted to uh, highlight to our audience today. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now about how the wine is made, basically the, the, the grapes are harvested normally because this will make a difference with this one here. Um, the grapes are harvested and are made into wine like it normally is, what we call a still wine or a dry wine, which is your regular wine without any bubbles in it. And basically what happens is they will put them in these special bottles. They will add a little bit of sugar and a little bit of yeast. And then they will put these one of these things on called the crown cap. And what happens is the yeast uh, will start to eat the sugar and then produce carbon dioxide. And that's trapped in the wine when in the bottle. And that's how they do it simply in, Chardon in uh, Champagne. Um, that's how this wine is produced, the Row 13 Chenin Blanc. Uh, that's how this wine is produced, the Jackson Triggs Entourage. That's how this wine is produced, the uh, Odie from Covert Farms. 
The wine in the middle here, this is Stone Boat's P uh, Pinot Blanc. It's called the Piano. It's made with Pinot Blanc. Both of these ones are made with Pinot Blanc. This one, however, is made in what they call the tank method, so that they have a special tank that's pressurized. So it will actually, they'll do the fermentation in the tank. All the carbon dioxide will stay in the tank, and, and it reaches very high pressure, apparently. And then they will bottle it from there. So this wine is made in this bottle. This wine is made in a tank that is then bottled from under pressure afterwards. Quality-wise, is there a difference? Maybe a little bit in terms of the bubble size, but taste-wise, it'll be nice and sparkling and bubbly and lovely. Now, what about uh, cost factor for the facility itself? Is this a more economical way to be able to produce the sparkling wine as opposed to this way, or do you think it's about the same and it's just preference? No, much more expensive, actually, to do it this way. There's a lot more storage involved, a lot more bottles. They have to buy the bottles earlier. They're storing the bottles for two, three, four years sometimes. So there's a lot more manual labor involved in this. There's a lot more... Uh, it's basically just a generally overall more expensive. But is it worth it? Well... Absolutely. Now, the original purchasing of the tanks, those are very, very uh, high-quality tanks that they've used at Stone Boat, uh, and those aren't cheap either. So, again, it kind of, it, you know, they came from, I think they came from Italy, I believe. Uh, they had to be brought over in two of them. So, it could be that there's uh, not necessarily some cost savings right away, but definitely a different, a, just a different style is what it works out to be. So now perhaps you can talk about, because I didn't realize that the, there was an aging process with the sparkling wine as well. So perhaps you can just allude to that. I know you said that this one, it does have to age three to four years, yes. but just talk about, is that traditional with all uh, sparkling wines that it needs to age a certain amount of time? Sometimes. For the, for the traditional champagne method, yes, you will probably want to age your wines uh, at least for a couple of years. What that will happen is when, as I mentioned, that the yeast and the sugar are put into this bottle, this bottle will be laid down to do that secondary fermentation, which is what that's called. And effectively, they will leave it on the lees, right? Once the yeast is finished, it will kind of die off and then fall to the bottom. And you'll get kind of a sediment. You notice all these bottles are on their side. Mm -hmm. There's a sediment that's going to form right along the bottom. And what that happens is that's the yeast cells that have basically fallen out. And what, they, what will happen is that those will start to break down. And then you'll start getting all the sort of flavors and aromas that come from what's called yeast autolysis. That's basically the breaking down of the yeast cells. So that's where you get the uh, aromas of bread and toast and sort of a um, kind of a um, like a fresh baked bread kind of yeasty aroma. You know when you go into a bakery at, or first thing in the morning and it just smells like like bread and it's just lovely. You can buy a bottle of Lovely, basically, is, which is what I like to think about it. Um, it's effectively just a, a beautiful, yeasty type aroma, and it's wonderful on the wine. So that basically that aging process, the longer, and sometimes they'll go for years. I think in row 13 here, they leave them here for a year and a half, almost two years. I'm not sure about that, but uh, I know some pies, I know they don't really, like this is their 2010, and this is their current vintage that they're selling right now in, in the end of 2013. So um, there's going to be a long production time in that, and a lot of that is having wine sit there in a cave like this. Very interesting. Now, uh, the other thing that I wanted you to be able to explain to uh, our viewers today is that I noticed two of them are corked and two of them are capped. And we've had a conversation before with wine on the difference between corking and capping. Mm -hmm. However, I know that a special connotation has always been made to champagne or sparkling wine, that that is part of the ambiance, part yeah. of the celebration is the popping of the cork. Yeah. So perhaps you can explain why some wineries may be deciding to veer away from that tradition and what difference it makes? Uh, really, there isn't that much difference in term for sparkling wine. For Road 13 in particular, they've got their label on the top here, the little tractor label that they use. Um, that was something that at the time when they started this sparkling wine program, they were using entirely screw tops on all of their wines. And so this kind of fit the image of the wine and the branding of the winery. So. Uh, when wines are being aged like they are behind us here, they're always in these crown caps. Even in Champagne, when you go there, they, they, use, them on, uh, they use them on the bottles there. It's only when they get bottled that they will use caps like this with the cage to secure it and it's actually a natural cork. That's something that is usually just something uh, added to finish the wine. So as, as a consumer-friendly uh, kind of uh, capsule, it's easy to take off, that kind of thing. Uh, as to the difference, why some of them are going this way, um, you know, it's actually, if you, 
they will both pop very loudly. I guarantee you when you break this one open, it will pop just as loud as the regular cork does. Uh, it's actually kind of scary actually when you actually do get to open one of these. Uh, it's very loud. Uh, now it doesn't hit the roof like a lot of these ones do sometimes, uh, which is actually kind of dangerous and yeah. sommeliers will actually tell you <laughs> <laughs> that's not the way to do it. Uh, but uh, it is fun. Uh, you know, I will say that and especially uh, I can't imagine the end of a Formula One auto race without somebody, you know, letting go of one of those things. Um, but basically, there isn't really that much of a difference when it comes to sparkling wine ver in cork versus the crown cap uh, in terms of quality or anything like that. Uh, yeah, as far as I know. I know that we talked um, previously about with wine, I think it was red wine, we were having that conversation with the cork and the cap. And part of it was so that you wouldn't have a bottle that was deemed what they'd say corked. And yes. you explained what that process is, but that's not the case with sparkling wine then there's no there wouldn't be a circumstance where you opened a bottle of champagne and it tasted corked or it tasted flat that doesn't occur in this type of situ it, situation it can but it can also be that the wine will be flat if that usually happens it means there's air getting out and that means that the bubbles will have gotten out as ready already so that you'll more likely find a bottle of wine that uh is is just basically flat so it's ruined along with being uh, you know, cork taint or tainted basically. Um, so yes, it may be cork, but that's the least of the worries of, the, of that particular bottle, right? If there's no bubbles, then it's just not very good wine anyways. Okay. Now that brings me to another question and uh, we want to pick your brain as long as we have you here sure. and that storage of sparkling wine. I know that you have to do that differently than red wine or white wine. So maybe you can elaborate on that. You want it a little cooler uh, for the most part. You don't have to, you can have it so that it's basically ready to go. So that basically you're in a, you're in a, uh, like you keep your wine in the wine fridge and then it's ready to roll. You just take it out and pop it open. So you basically want it to be serving temperature almost in a way. For wine caves like this, for storage, it is actually about the same as regular uh, white wine, red wine or white wine maturing. So really no, no seriously difference. It's really matter, it makes more of a difference that it's actually stable temperature, that there's no big t uh, temperature fluctuations from, you know, from season to season. So from, from summer, if it's 15 degrees to winter where it's still 15 degrees. Um, that's the biggest thing and that's why temperature controlled rooms like this are really important for a winery to have because it's uh, uh, It's very stable and that's the stability that you're looking for rather than the temperature itself So what about once you actually have opened it? So for example road 13 had that bottle of sparkling wine opened and now they plan to you know They still have to serve that until they finish that bottle How do they keep it so that it is still showing the bubbles the quality of bubbles over? the day that it's probably being served to customers. Well, they will actually put a cap that looks like this. This is a, uh, a sparkling wine, uh, a sparkling wine uh, sort of stopper. Um, the only difference with a regular stopper is that it's got these little wings on the side that will clamp on to the side of the bottle here. So it won't, you won't, it won't be able to be forced out. If you just put a regular cork on here in your fridge, in about an hour, the cork will blow itself out um, just from the pressure. There's actually more pressure in this bottle than there is in the tires of your car. Wow. Yeah, when a, when a wine bottle is new, there's up to 90 PSI, like pounds per square inch, uh, of pressure on these in these bottles. That's why they're very heavy. These are really heavy bottles for the most part. They have to be really heavy to sustain that pressure. Um, so even if you've drunk a little bit, there's going to be a little bit more space for that pressure to build up, so it won't build up quite so quickly but you'll still want to have it in with one of these caps uh, in the fridge at that point. As to how long it'll last, it depends on the quality of the wine to begin with. Uh, it depends on if it gets moved around, you know, the old trick with the Coke can, if you shake yeah. it up and then give it to your friend, uh, you know, that will release a lot of the carbon dioxide and it'll take it out of pressure as well. Uh, so you don't want to, uh, you don't want to uh, sort of disturb it quite so much. Once it's open and it's in the fridge and you've drunk half the bottle, then you want to store it for the next day or even no next week. It will, if it's sealed properly, it will actually last for, you know, a good week or so. Okay, so no corks. <laughs> we know that now. Now, could you use also, because I know that uh, I personally have, I think that might be mine actually, that um, a sparkling wine uh, preserver, yep. but you, I also have a red wine one where you pump. It's almost like, yeah. now you couldn't use that on a sparkling wine. No, no, you couldn't because you're basically, you're, yes, you're creating a vacuum and you're pumping out the, the air there, but what's going to happen is the carbon dioxide is going to come out of the wine and it's going to just fill up that space and then 
put a positive pressure on it instead of a negative pressure. So when you pump out the wine, you're creating a negative pressure, and then effectively it will just get filled up by the carbon dioxide coming out. And you'll actually probably damage it a little more because you're pulling the carbon dioxide out. So uh, again, not recommended because the, again, those will those things will just blow right out too. Okay, and then the last one is is that I know that uh, for a old wives' tale, and you can and correct it or validate it, and that is I've seen people that put, and my mother yeah. suggested putting a silver spoon in the the bottom side of a silver spoon oh, yeah. into your champagne bottle, and that and then into the fridge, and that keeps the bubbles. What do you think about that? I haven't tried that personally. Yeah. Um, have you uh, heard that? I have. I've heard the other things too. There is a lot of those things come from. Uh, sort of detection methods for counterfeiting and uh, you know what I mean like they'll actually they're actually kind of uh, like the the word for toast you know what I mean when you when you say when you have a toast the origin of that word is from Roman times when you would put in a piece of toast and that would tell you somehow that you know if the if it was po you know if it was poisoned or not if you were drinking <laughs> stuff so so that was your way of guaranteeing that you weren't going to be you know poisoned to death uh, somehow so you know, happy thoughts when you're toast. <laughs> <laughs> and you can try that method, and, and sometimes you find by trial and error. So, exactly. Luke, Luke, I want to thank you so much for showcasing our sparkling wines today, especially our locals, and being here at Road 13 in the Sparkling Cave. And just before we end, I, I want you to be able to share with us your um, venture that you've done for several years now, why you know so many of these things. Just elaborate quickly on your, uh, your blog, and I'm thinking Wine Country BC. Yeah, winecountrybc.ca is a podcast and a blog that I've done for about four and a half years now. And uh, we have uh, episodes on iTunes. There's currently 138 episodes up there. You can learn about wine. It's all people from the industry, uh, like myself, uh, who work in the industry here in the South Okanagan in various ways. And uh, basically, we like to get together, talk about wine. I'll do interviews with people. I'll be, I'll be you, actually. And I, do I go around interviewing people with microphones. And uh, I basically talk to winemakers, winery owners, sommeliers, uh, uh, people just people generally in the wine industry and uh, we talk about all things from from specific wines to the geology of the Okanagan to uh, you know why Okanagan Lake is even there that kind of thing so. well it certainly is fascinating there's so much to know about wine and we're definitely in wine country being wine capital of Canada so Luke thank you so much this has been a segment with talking with wine with Luke Whittle and it's Margie Basso with East Link TV mm -hmm.